pastors from all over the world in about two weeks' time. Uh, we have pastors flying in from Argentina, from Mexico, from South Korea, from Portugal, from uh, everywhere. Literally, you can just point a country on the map. There should be a church planter coming from there. And we're going to be hosting the meeting here uh, in South Africa for the first time. And uh, Faith Hill Church is going to be hosting as a church. It's a great blessing that we get to be a blessing to other people from uh, all over the world. Amen. I think it's about time Africans start hosting other people. And uh, instead of just extending empty baskets for, you know, basket case. No, we are not a basket case. Amen. Uh, we also have means to host some people. So we're going to be hosting about 71 of them. And uh, with that, two things are happening. The first one is that we uh, would like to invite all the volunteers that uh, can make it on the 19th of October. We have a spring cleaning day where we're just going to get together at this place, Eagle's Nest, at 9 in the morning where we're just going to give this place a little manicure. Uh, so that when the visitors get here, they don't think they are in the jungle and they have to hunt their own breakfast. Amen? <laughs> so we want to give it a little great manicure and just, you know, give it a nice touch, a faith heal touch. So we're going to be here. Bring uh, all the cleaning utensils that you want to use on the day. If you have brooms and uh, 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 scissors, garden, uh, 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 I don't know what they call them, and forks and whatever you can bring, let's do this. Amen? It's going to be fun. Uh, we get to clean this place up. And also during the conference, we'd like to invite if you have a heart to serve. And this one is really for people who have a heart to serve because it's not going to be pretty. It's just going to be straight up work, you know. Uh, during the conference from the 23rd to about the 20, 24th to about the 26th. So it starts on Thursday from 8 to 5 p.m. and uh, all the way through to Saturday noon. So why I say it's dirty uh, work is that it's 54 adults who can sometimes be kids, and we just want to try and make sure that we look after them. Some of them can't speak English. Probably half of them can speak only Spanish, so you need a, a, a gift of the Holy Spirit called long suffering <laughs> or patience. Amen. So, I mean, but it's a great opportunity for you to spend some time with some people that don't look like you and learn some different cultures. I think it will be great. And, uh, you know, just cleaning after them, some of them, and we feed them and so on and so forth. So if you would like to sign up for that, please make sure you see Jabu. Uh, she will be able to help you with that. Amen. 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 Praise Amen. the Lord. Amen. Jabu, you want to stand quickly so that everybody can see you? That's Jabu. Please see Jabu. Amen. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. God is good. Um, he left out a lot of stuff, yeah, but, you know, but that's good. You know, I think he's not ready to talk about it. But, it, you know, they needed a, a process of healing, you know, because of something tragic that had happened in their previous pregnancy. But we uh, thank God where we're at now. Minana is here, and uh, it's a blessing. Amen. Why don't you hold your Bible, lift it up real high, and shout, this is my Bible. This is my I believe what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I am a believer and not a doubter. A doer, not just a hearer. Today, I will learn from God's word and my life will never be the same. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Amen. So we've been talking about, uh, you know, uh, the power of words or how you can design your life with the words of your mouth. And uh, building up to today, we also talked about how you cannot uh, uh, contextualize this in the name it and claim it, blab it and grab it uh, kind of framework. We're not saying that you just can walk around, you know, claiming stuff. You know, claiming people's nice cars or nice houses or, or nice husbands or nice wives and expect, you know, God to deliver them to you. That, that's not going to work. Amen. But what we are saying is you can go through your vocabulary or the words that you use consistently and begin to see that you are either operating in the place of victory or you're operating in the place of uh, a victim. Amen. And we said last week that you need to take the victim out of your vocabulary, amen. Right. amen, and begin to release victory through the words of your mouth. Uh, moving right along, we're going to go to our foundational scripture, Proverbs 18, verse 21, which says, death and life 
are in the power of the tongue. And they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. We want to welcome those of you who are watching uh, online. Amen. We have some online viewers. Uh, here, scripture gives us a principle of life. And he's saying in this principle that both death and life are resident in the power of the tongue. So what that means is we can either release death or we can release life with our mouths. Amen? So words are not just empty breaths of air with syllables, but words are life carriers or death carriers. And by life, we, we, we are not just limiting this to uh, existence. By life, we are talking about uh, everything that Jesus paid for on the cross, your peace, your prosperity, your healing, and so on and so forth. You can begin to authorize that or release it into your life by way of speaking it into existence. Amen? Or alternatively, you can begin to authorize death. And by death, we're not just limiting this to you ceasing to breathe. Uh, we are, are talking about everything that came into existence as a result of what Adam did in the garden. We're talking about the curse. We're talking about fear. We are talking about panic. We are talking about impossibility. We're talking about, you know, everything that basically limits you uh, from experiencing uh, the goodness of God in your life and a godly living. Amen? amen. I said amen. amen. And so these things can be released over our lives uh, through the words of our mouth. So what that means is the words that we speak are important. Mm -hmm. they, are, they are valuable. Amen? amen. I said amen. Amen. We need to pay attention to what we are saying because it's, it's got creative ability. Now, let's go to James chapter number 3, and we want to read from verse 2 to 6. James chapter number 3 from verse 2 to 6. This is Pastor James. He was teaching on a series on the power of words, and he takes us on a journey, and he uses three examples to reveal this truth. And he says in verse 2, For in many ways, in many things, uh, we offend all. But if any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man and is able to bridle his whole body. So here the Apostle James is saying something very interesting. He is saying that if a man learns how to use his words or if a man learns the power of words, uh, he is a mature man. He says he's a perfect man. Uh, that phrase, perfect man, is not talking about a flawless man. None of us can ever be flawless in our own strength. Only Jesus was perfect. But he's saying we can be mature. Only a man uh, uh, with spiritual maturity has learned the power of words or the power to carefully uh, use words uh, in their household, uh, with others, and uh, also with themselves. What you tell yourself matters because it's either delivering uh, life or it's delivering death. Amen? So for us to operate in a place of maturity, uh, we need to learn this truth. And he says in verse 3, Behold, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole bodies. So he's talking about, the first example here is talking about how we control horses, you know, the powerful creature with tons and tons of muscle, and it could literally kick you to death. Yet you can control it, and the way you control it, even though you could be probably a tenth of its size in terms of weight, you can still ride a horse and be able to tell it what to do. And you don't do that by physically getting off the horse and holding the leg and say, we're turning left. You do that by pulling on the reins that are attached to the tongue. As you pull the tongue to the left, the whole body has no choice but to begin to go to the left. When you pull the tongue upwards uh, towards the top of its mouth, it's, it knows it's time to jump. When you pull to the left, it knows it's time to... And here, the Apostle James is literally using this example to say your life could be out of control right now, but you can begin to rein it back in by the tongue or by the power of your words. Do you get that? So, so words are powerful. You know, I know people say sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never harm me. Words will kill you. Words are the ones that are either making you turn left or turn right or jump or whatever. You know, they're directing your life. Amen. And he gives us another example in verse 4. He says, behold, also sh the ships. Anybody ever seen a ship? Yeah. Notice he didn't say behold a boat. He says, behold, a ship. 
And when you look at this, I've never been on a ship, but when you look at some of these big ships and you go on Google and you type, you know, a cruise ship and you get in, into the, it literally looks like a city. I mean, these things are, they are huge. They look like a city. And he says something powerful here. He said as, as big as it is, a ship which though they be great and are driven of fierce winds, yet they are turned about with a very small helm or rudder or steering whithersoever the governor listeth. So he's using another example, you know, of the ship and equating your mouth, your tongue to the rudder, to the, you know, a helm, to the steering that controls the big ship. He's saying, you know, as much as we turn the ship to the left, to the right, uh, with a little steering, so can we turn your life around uh, with a little uh, uh, a word that you use, with the careless words or the, you know, careful words that you throw around. You can begin to direct uh, your life. Amen? Do you get the picture? Yeah. So words are powerful. Words can, can, can control the entire atmosphere on that ship. Yeah. I mean, this thing is going against fierce storms sometimes, high waves, and it has to pierce through it. And how does it get it to go through it, through the ham? Uh, good to see Ruva here. She, you know, she, she goes on cruise ships a lot, go all over. So you know I'm not lying if I'm preaching confidently and she's in the house. Amen? Amen. I mean, things can get pretty shaky on the ship, but, you know, as long as the, the, the captain... Is, is controlling the thing, is on the helm, man, you know you're going to get to your destination. It's the same thing. As long as you learn how to use your mouth, I don't care how much is going on around you or how much is coming against you. You can still pierce through all of the drama and get to your destination. Amen? But you need to grab a hold of the steering. You need to grab a hold of your vocabulary. You need to grab a hold of the words that you speak primarily over yourself. And those you have jurisdiction over. Man, you need to be careful the kind of words you use uh, 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 around your children. You need to be careful the kind of words you use around uh, uh, each other as husband and wife. You need to be careful. You know, I was saying in the first service as a pastor, I get an opportunity to, to, to visit uh, people's homes. Uh, it's not something that I particularly enjoy, but as a pastor, I have to do it. I have to put up with it. I have to be able, you know, I, I, li- I preferably I'd li- rather be at home, you know, sitting on my couch watching Arsenal play soccer. That, um, can I be honest with y'all? That's what I prefer. But, you know, sometimes I have to visit with people, and I love doing it. And sometimes you can walk into someone's house and uh, 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 feel that there's a certain kind of atmosphere here. And that was created by words. And sometimes these words were spoken last week. But this, anybody knows what I'm talking about? Is this foreign? Yeah, you walk in, you're like, man, everybody's trying to be nice. They're smiling. Oh, Pastor, welcome. But you can tell this just, man, I can get a knife and cut through this atmosphere. That's what words do. Words can create an atmosphere. (laughs) Watch this. They can create an atmosphere of health or they can create an atmosphere of death. They can create an atmosphere of flourishing. Man, you could make that house smell as beautiful as some of these flowers. You could do it literally with the words that you speak. Or you could make that place, man, just not nice. Amen? So words are powerful. And the third example he gives us is in verse... He says, even so the tongue is a little member. It's a little member of your body and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. So now he's talking about fires. You know how you start a fire with a matchstick? You know, a fire that could literally burn down the whole forest. A fire that could literally burn down the whole house starts as a spark, a matchstick issue. A carelessness with little words can literally burn down the whole village. When you don't learn how to use your words the right way. Amen? So there's a value that we need to attach uh, to the words that we speak. Think about it, process it, and then release life. Amen? Someone shout, I speak life and not death. It says in verse 6, a tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue amongst our members, that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature. It is set on fire of hell. So we learn here the importance of words using three different examples. Man, I, I dare you. Sometimes when you have an issue uh, at home, at work, I dare you to go back and find out what the issue was. Sometimes you realize it was just a small matchstick issue. It shouldn't have burnt down the whole forest, really. But because words were not uh, carefully used, uh, they can bring about death. Amen? Let's go now to Matthew chapter number 8, and we're going to read from verse 5 to 13. 
Thank you, Jesus. And let me tell you, there is not an issue big enough that cannot be reversed by the words of your mouth, especially when you've learned how to speak the words of Jesus. Man, you can reverse any issue in your life. Amen? It says in Matthew 8, from verse 5 to 13, Now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. And here's what the centurion man said. The centurion man answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof. But only speak a word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority. Having soldiers under me, I say to this one, go, and he goes. To another one, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. Now, when Jesus heard this, this is, this is powerful. Listen to this. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. Not even in the house of faith, household of faith, Israel. I have not seen such great faith. What is Jesus? What, 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 Jesus, uh, what made Jesus uh, consider this man's faith as great? In fact, the Bible said he marveled. Jesus looked at this man and he marveled. And I believe what was happening here is this man was tapping into the spiritual realm and talking about spiritual truths that are beyond uh, what is presently manifested around us. He said there is a spiritual correlation with what I do and what you do based on who you claim to be. He's saying in the physical, I'm a centurion, I'm a man under authority, and I have servants be below me. So essentially he's saying to Jesus, you are also a man under authority, and we know that Jesus was under authority to God the Father, amen? And he's saying you are a man under authority, and here's what blew my mind is that he's also implying that Jesus is spiritual entities unto him that will go and heal his servant. Because yeah. he says, I have servants, so do you. So, you know, when dealing with my servants, all I have to do is say, go. And what happens to them? They go. Uh, come. And what happens? They come. And he's saying to Jesus, I know spiritually there's some people that you can tell to go, and they will go, come, and they will come. Yeah. And I want to submit to you this morning that not only... Uh, 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 did Jesus have this special privilege of these special people that would respond uh, to whatever he says, go, go, and they go, come, and they come. You also have these people. Amen. And these, peoples are, these people are called angels. Yeah. All of us in here have some angels assigned to us that we can tell to go, and they go. As long as you are under, under the authority of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, you have angels assigned. Man, how many of you know that angels are not fairy tales? How many, in fact, the only time I ever heard uh, anybody talk about angels was when, you know, someone had died at, at a funeral and they would say, oh, no, that means we have one more angel just watching over us from heaven. And I'm thinking, oh, great. What am I going to do with someone just watching me? <laughs> See, I think practically. I don't know some of you like religious games, but I'm thinking, oh, great. What am I going to do with someone just, just looking at me, just... Smiling at me. I have more. What am I going to do with that? How, how's that going to help? How's that going to add to anything? How's that going to add to anything? And then I read scripture and I found out, no, 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 no. Actually, uh, there were other angels uh, uh, that were created by God to help us. Let's go to Hebrews chapter number one, verse 14. How many of you would like to know uh, about these angels? Yep. Hebrews chapter number one, verse 14. He says, are they not all ministering spirits? He's talking about angels sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation. Did you see that? He said angels are ministering spirits. Someone say they are ministering spirits. <coughs> sent forth to minister to me. Now, usually the word minister uh, uh, is usually equated with what I'm doing right now. They say, you know, pastor is ministering to us. But, you know, in its simplest form, the word minister simply means to serve. S-E-R-V-E. -E. So here he's saying these ministering spirits or angels have been given for you or to you for them to serve you. Yeah. Now, when I read that, I got excited. Mm -hmm. And the next question I had was, in what way? Because I would hate to find out when I get to heaven that I had some angels to serve me 
and help me with the dishes, and I never knew about it. <laughs> or to help me wash the, do the laundry, and I, knew, I never knew about it. So I wanted to find out in what way are these angels assigned to serve me. Isn't that a valid question? Yeah. Let's find out through scripture. In fact, if you read the same verse in the New Living Translation, it says, therefore, angels are only servants. Did you read that? Is it up there? It says angels are only what? Seven. That means you don't, you don't, you don't get to uh, uh, worship them. They're only servants. Remember what the centurion said? Centurion man, he said, because I have servants, I know how to get my servants busy. I use two words. Go. Come. And they go. And they come. Do this, do that, and I give them responsibilities, and I keep them busy. And it's the same thing here. They've been given to be servants. Now, spirits sent to care for the people who inherit the salvation. So the angels have been given for you and I, the people who have inherited the salvation. But how do we get these angels to work for us? How do we practically get them to do some stuff for us? Let's go to Psalm 103, verse 20. Thank you, Jesus. Some of you are still, you know, doubting in your mind and you're thinking, Pastor T, I don't know if this angel's things is, is true. I don't, you know, I only believe it. I, you know what, Pastor T, I only believe it if I see them. Question. How many of you used Wi-Fi last week? Anybody used Wi-Fi? The internet Wi-Fi? Yeah, yeah. How many of you have ever seen what Wi-Fi looks like? Is Wi-Fi, these little entities, these bubbles that when you connect, you know, and you put the password, they start drip, going into your phone. You say, what are you doing? I'm connecting to Wi-Fi. Look at all this Wi-Fi that I have. None of us have ever seen Wi-Fi, yeah. but all of us have used Wi-Fi. Yeah. In fact, some of us, the first thing we ask for when we get to a place is, what's the Wi-Fi password? <laughs> Amen. It's the same with radio frequencies. Anybody ever seen a radio frequency, what it looks like? You know, the one that delivers picture to your television set. Anybody ever seen what it looks like? What does it look like? Does it look like a leaf? What does it look like? Does it look like water? Does it look like ice? What does it? None of us have ever seen these things. Yet, we will swear and say there are radio frequencies in this room. Radio frequencies in my car. But we've never seen them. And yet when God turns around and says, I've given you angels to minister to you, so I only believe it when I see it. <laughs> Man, you see how sometimes we get it twisted? Man, in fact, we believe what everybody else is saying except God. Yeah. For the most part, we believe, you know, people will go to the doctor, talk to the doctor, tell the doctor what the problem is, and the doctor will scribble, you know, a little thing called a prescription that you can't read, yeah. by the way. <laughs> Only Chido can read that. (laughs) Everybody else can't read what the, yeah, she's a pharmacist. None of us can read what the thing says, and we will swear by it. We will guard that thing with all our lives, and we will go and give it to a person we've never met before. We don't know their name, their surname. We don't know where they came from, and we will give them that little thing, and they will go to the back and bring back a little bottle with capsules, and none of us up in here ever ask for the chemical composition in the capsules. Yeah. You'll take that thing and you'll say, say what? Three times a day after meals? That's exactly what I'm going to do. And then you get home, and after every meal, you take it religiously. But you never met any of these people. And then God turns around and says, I've given you angels to serve you. Pastor, I'll only believe it when I see it. Man, all I'm saying is, why don't you cut some slack to God just like you cut some slack to everybody else? Because you believe everybody else anyway. (laughs) Why don't you believe what God says as well without seeing it? Does that help you? It says in Psalm 103, verse 20, Bless the Lord, ye his angels, that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. So essentially he's saying in this verse two things. The first thing is that these angels excel in strength, hearkening unto the voice of his word. He's saying angels go to work or spring into action when they hear God's word, they hearken or they pay attention for God's word to bring it to pass. Yeah, 
So the en- only thing that angels are moving for is God's word. Yeah. Amen. 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 Let's read it in the Passion Translation. I want you to see this. He says, so bless the Lord, <clears throat> in the TPT, if you will. He says, so bless the Lord, all his messengers of power, for you are his mighty heroes who listen intently to the voice of his word to do it. Now, what I found out was that uh, uh, God's word uh, does not have a voice. The Bible does not speak. It's just pages. Do you know who gives the Bible voice? It's you and me. When you take the promises of God and begin to speak them, you are what I like to call voice activating them. You know, like you're talking to Siri. You say, Siri, do this, call this person, do that, buy me lunch or get me an Uber and so on and so forth. That's exactly what you're doing with the angels when you're beginning to speak the promises of God. And so Jesus said to the angel, uh, uh, to the angels, just like this centurion man said, go and heal this servant. And you know what happened? The servant was healed. Now, this is what's going to blow your mind. She was healed immediately. You know why? Because angels can travel by teleporting. They can go immediately and do the things that need to be done. But here's the deal. They only go into action, excel in strength, when you say something from God's word. They listen intently or they listen carefully for God's word. Waiting for you to speak something from God's word so that they can spring into action. So they're not moving for complaining. I thought I was going to get an amen. Amen. They're not moving for your opinion. They're not moving from you talking about the issue. You know what? I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to get on the phone and and talk to my best friend about this issue and just pour out. The angels are still waiting. The angels are just waiting, man. You know why? Because the fuel for the angels to go is the word of God. Amen. They go into action when you, when you speak God's word. And when you become proficient, number one, in understanding that you have to release life. Number two, in putting God's word in your mouth and release it, the angels begin to act on your behalf. Watch this all the time. Man, you have angels, ministering spirits that have been assigned to you that are waiting for you to speak something from God's word so that they can bring it to pass. Man, that's powerful. That's awesome. That is huge. So all you have to do is speak God's word and not complain and not mama. Amen? Amen. I said amen. Amen. (laughs) Man, I have to say, some of you will be presented with brand new angels when you get to heaven if you don't speak anything from God's word because your angels are sticking around you just waiting. Just waiting. Some of your angels have to go to these support groups, angels, support groups. Say, my name is Gabriel. My believer never says anything from God's word. (laughs) And I'm concerned. My name is Michael. My believer never says anything from God's word. (laughs) Hello, Michael. And they're just waiting. They're just waiting for you to say something. You will complain about it. They can't spring into action. You have an opinion about it. They can't spring into action. But when you start saying something from God's word, only then will they begin to spring into action because they excel in strength when you begin to speak God's word. So you need to put some mileage on your angels. You don't want a brand new angel in heaven because there's not much help you're going to get from them in heaven. Amen? Amen. I said amen. Amen. So you need a brand new angel. Let's go to, you need to get your angels working. So let's go now to Daniel chapter number 10 and see this in action. Daniel chapter number 10, we're going to read from verse 1 to 3. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Man, when you start understanding the value and the economy of words, uh, you start to speak less and accomplish more. See, when, when, when you understand the value of words, you don't have to do a whole lot of talking. You just show up to Lazarus' tomb and you pray a three-word prayer. Have you thought about it? I mean, this dude is dead. He's been dead for how long? About three days. And uh, the sisters are saying, by now he probably smells. He stinks. And Jesus goes there and he doesn't pray a paragraph. He prays a three-word prayer because he understands the value of words. So he shows up and he says, Lazarus, come forth. 
and the man rose from the dead. But if you don't understand the, the, the value of words, you, you, you may be operating from an economy where words are valueless and you may need a whole lot of them. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, Amen. the God of Isaac, <laughs> Jacob, Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. Lord, just like you did it for Moses at the Red Sea. Man, you're going to need a whole lot of words. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is if your words have value, you need less. Amen? Let, let me give you another example. If, 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 if one of you guys uh, uh, gets a, a, an unction from the Holy Ghost Amen. to buy me uh, uh, an iPhone 11, hallelujah. Yes, <laughs> yeah, what you need, if you are going to buy it in U.S. dollars, you only need about $700. But if you're going to use uh, Zimbabwean <laughs> dollars in 2008, you may need about 14 quintillion. <laughs> How many of you realize that the 14 quintillion is an equal value to the $700? Yeah. Except that one yeah. belongs to an economy where words are valueless. Yeah. Do you get the picture? Yeah. When you start understanding the value of words and put uh, 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 a value in the words that you speak and words mean much to you, you speak less and accomplish much. Amen. You only need 700 bucks to do what you needed, you know, 14 quintillion just a few weeks ago for. That's why the Bible encourages us. Here's, here's what's powerful. The Bible encourages us and it says, let your Yes, be a yes, and let your no be a no. What essentially he's saying is, begin to put value in the words that you speak. Because when your yes is not really a yes, what you're telling your heart is, words are valueless. It doesn't matter what I say. And I had to learn the hard way with the children. You know, my kids would show up and say, Daddy, can I have ice cream? And I'd say, not today. And they'd say, when? And I'd say, tomorrow. But, you know, I didn't really mean tomorrow. I, I meant never. <laughs> and then they would come back tomorrow and say, okay, today is the day that the Lord has made. <laughs> Yesterday you said that you were going to buy me ice cream tomorrow. And then I would say, oh, man. <laughs> I was banking on you not to remember. But what I was doing is I was training my heart to devalue the words that I speak. Yeah. Now, here's what my heart will think. It's, it's going to think the same thing. When I say, be healed in Jesus' name, it's going to think, you know what? We never mean anything we say anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> so why is this one important? Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. So let your yes be a yes and your no be a no. Let's practice. Someone say yes. yes. Now say no. no. How hard is that? So the next time someone, you know, comes from work, uh, can I have some money? What should you say? No, 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 you don't say that. You don't say that. You must, you must give them some money, man. You must give them some money. People are like, no. If you're not going to give them, don't give them false hope. You know, and just kind of use words in a flowery, clever way. Because what you're doing is you're training your heart to think that words don't matter. So it's really about, you know, what you're speaking to your heart. Amen? So you want to train your heart to, to know that there is a value in words. Four minutes? Okay, let's do this in four minutes. Daniel, chapter number 10, from one, uh, verse 1 to 3. In the third year of Cyrus, the king of Persia, a message was revealed to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar. The message was true. Please don't name your children Belteshazzar. Please. <laughs> It's a Bible name, but, you know, it's going to be hard on some of us. The message was true, but the appointed time was long. And he understood the message and had understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three, four weeks. So Daniel prayed a prayer, and it took long for him to see the answered prayer. And so Daniel went on a fast, not to try and get God to move, because God is already moved by grace. Amen? Your, your, your fasting does not move God. It moves your heart yeah. to be sensitive to God. Amen? Amen? So he started fasting for about three weeks. And while he was doing so, the Bible says in verse 10, suddenly... A hand touched him, touched Daniel. Uh, a hand touched me, which made me tremble on my knees and on the palms of my hands. 
And he said to me, O oh, Daniel, uh, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for I have been sent to you. While he was speaking this word to me, I stood trembling. Then he said to me, do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day, someone say first day. First day. So his prayer was answered and heard on the first day. He said, from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard. So the prayer was answered immediately. It just took time uh, uh, for it to manifest. Do you get that? Yeah. You know, God answers immediately when you're in faith. But, you know, you now need to stand in faith, stay in faith, for you to translate that answered prayer into manifestation in the physical realm. Amen? So, for example, you know, you're praying for someone to get healed. God may say, go and lay your hands on them. Or send elders to anoint them with oil. You know, scripture says all kinds of stuff uh, around how we can get someone healed. That's the you transmitting the power from the spiritual realm that has already been, been provided into the physical realm. You get the picture? And sometimes it may take time. But what do you do during the period it's taking time? You don't call back your words. Amen. You leave your words to do the work. That's why the Bible says in Hebrews 10, verse 23, let us hold fast to the confession of our faith without wavering because he who has promised is also faithful to do it. In other words, when you speak it, you don't call it back by saying something contrary to what you have already released during the three weeks. You don't say, you know, uh, by stripes I'm healed, but the doctor's diagnosis says this. You don't say, uh, 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 my needs are going to be met according to his riches and glory by Christ. It's but. Look at how much I have in the bank account. Because whatever you put on the other side of the uh, uh, word but is really what you mean and what you're standing on. So don't repudiate. Don't cancel the words that you have released by faith by speaking something contrary. Because the manifestation has taken time. You get the picture? Man, you keep speaking in faith. And you, once you've released those words... Those words have gone to work. Amen? Now watch what he says in, um, in the, as he concludes that verse. He says, from the very first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before God, your words were heard. Someone say, your words were heard. Words were heard. Now say these words, and I have come, I have come. Because, of your words. because of your words. Remember we said angels respond to whose words? Your words. And here the angel is saying to Daniel, the reason I'm here is not because you're cute. It's not because of your race. It's not because of, you know, uh, uh, your, your persuasion. Sure. It's not because of any of that. The reason I'm here is I have come because of your words. words. Man, the, I, I wished. This is just my personal wish. If wishes were horses, we would be riding everywhere. Amen. But here's my personal wish. I wished everything huge and meaningful, every turn of event that comes into manifestation in, in my life at least introduced itself this way. With a lightning bolt, you know those times when I'm walking around saying, I, I just can't do this anymore. When impossibility and not being able to do this anymore shows up to uh, where I live and it rings the bell, ding dong. I say, who's there? It's me. Who? Me? You not being able to do anything Another day in your life. Not being able to operate in the power of God. I'm here to embrace you. What are you here doing for? I have come because of thine words. That's what King James says. It says thine, which means your words. I have come because of your words. You know, when you walk around and you say, man, you know what? I'm just broke, busted, and disgusted. And then broke, busted, and disgusted. Show up at the gate. You know, in South Africa, they can... When someone shows up at your gate, they can find you even on your phone. You don't have to be at home. So he shows up, broke, busted, and disgusted. Tindo, at the gate, they ring your phone. Hello? Who is this? Broke, busted, and disgusted. I don't know you. What are you here for? I am here because of... Because if it did that, if it was that dramatic, you know what that would do? It would conscientize me to start using my words in a better way. 
You know, when you call your little ones, uh, you, you never amount to anything. You're just like your father. You never, you, you just, and then they show up just acting like daddy. You say, where, where does this one come from? He just acts like the father. Just rude. Just rude and disrespectful. I wonder where they got that. And then, you know, ding dong. Just to remind you, uh, 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 they became this way uh, because of thine word. You know, I actually, to be honest, I actually don't like this job. Girl, <laughs> I actually hate it. And then Monday, Monday night, Monday morning, Monday morning, at about 6 a.m., you feel all kinds of emotions going on on the inside of you. And you wonder, why do I feel this way every Monday? No, it's just the Monday blues that were delivered because of thine word. Man, if it introduced itself this way, we would be careful about how we use words. We would start using words to speak life. Amen? I mean, we have uh, some, some, some uh, few guys here who have run the, 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 the Comrades Marathon, and, and I have a question for them. What would happen? Because some of you are still, you know, grappling with this and thinking, but words don't really matter. You know, sticks and stones may break my bones. But words will never harm me. No, you know, let's say you're running the two oceans and you, you, you're, you're on the race. There are people, there's a tunnel of people in the neighbors that you're running through. Let's say there's some people, you know, on the both sides of the road and that keep shouting, you suck at running. <laughs> I don't know if Umlani may be able to help me with this. And I wonder how much uh, uh, of encouragement and energy you can draw from that. You know what? You suck at running. You're trying, 10 kilometers. You may be able to ignore them, the first 5Ks, but I can guarantee you by about 15Ks, you know what? Maybe I do suck at running. (laughs) Amen? So the words that are being spoken around you matter. But here's the, 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 the opposite of that. Let's say you're running, and there are people on the other side of the road saying, come on, you can do this. When you feel like giving up, come on, you can do this. It's just 80 more kilometers to go. I don't know if you can say that. It's only 80 more to go. (laughs) Come on, you can do this. Would you like some more? They're speaking life into your journey. And as they speak life into it, it does something to your emotions. It does something to your thinking. So words really matter, brothers and sisters. That's what I'm trying to say this morning. So instead of saying, I am tired all the time, Instead of saying that, here's what you can say. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Instead of saying, I'm under spiritual attack, here's what you can say. Jesus won my victory and I'm victorious. Instead of saying, I get a flu every winter, here's what you can say. Jesus bore my sickness on the cross and I live in divine health. Instead of saying, I don't have enough, here's what you can say. All my needs are met in Jesus. Instead of saying, I am weak, here's what the prophet Joel told us to say in Joel 3, verse 10. Let the weak say, I am strong. Instead of saying there is a casting down, here's what Job 22, verse 29 told us. He said, when there is a casting down, you shall say, there is a lifting up. And the songwriter said, let the poor say, I am rich. Amen? Amen. What you're doing is you're using your words to steer your ship, your horse, your life into a different direction. And for some of you, your ship may be your marriage. It may be your job. It may be your business. Man, the things that you speak over your business. For some of you, it may be your garden back at home. Man, there's a little tree that caused me so much grief. The, The palm tree. Because everybody else in the complex were buying big palm trees. And I decided I was going to buy a small palm tree. And then it would grow one day and become a big palm tree. One day. And then by about four years, I mean, this little thing is still my height. And I'm thinking, man, this is not a palm tree. This is not what I had in mind. I should have bought the big palm tree. And then I'd go and I'd water the garden. While I'm watering the garden, or you know, uh, uh, just getting rid of the weeds, I'd be speaking death to this thing, man. Did you, when are you going to grow like your friends across from the moon? This thing will never grow, man. I should, have bought, I should have bought the one next to you. And guess what? That thing never grew. And then one day the Lord said to me, why don't you start speaking? Why don't you use your sermons on this thing? Yes. 
<laughs> and now I change. Now I speak life to it, and I haven't seen any physical manifestation externally. But guess what? I had been speaking death for about four years, yeah. and I've only been speaking months for, you know, I've been speaking life for yeah. about four months. <laughs> So I'm not in any rush. Okay, I'm going to speak life for as long as I see that tree. I drive in every, and I say, you grow, you're going to grow. You are a big, beautiful, big palm tree that makes me look good in the neighborhood, ain't it? Not the big, I mean, I'm trying to speak life to this thing. You know why? Because speaking death is not helping the situation. For some of you, it's your studies. You know, there's one particular module that just makes you say, I can't do this. You need to start speaking to yourself. For some of them, it was maths, it was science, it was chemistry, (laughs) biology, and so on. You need to start speaking to yourself. Just like that runner, you know, running the comrades, telling himself, I can do this. And hearing others saying, I can do this. Not only do you need to speak to yourself, be around people that will begin to tell you, you know what, you can do this. Brother, keep going, you can do this. And as you do that, there's going to be a life infusion on your journey. Amen? Did that help you? Man, I'm telling you, this will change your life once you start putting it to action. Why don't you stand on your feet?